uh, welcoming um, the next conversation. So to the virtual stage, we are going to welcome Sharzad Rafati, founder and CEO at Bronbad TV. And we're going to welcome Amber Mack, keynote speaker, a selling author, TV host, and tech expert. We are going to be talking about the journey from start to IPO, which is one heck of a journey. And you are both here. So welcome, welcome you both. I'm excited for this conversation. I also just want to uh, let the audience know that we will be taking questions at around 1120. So if you have any questions uh, for Sharzad or Amber to please put them in the chat feature. Off to you both. All right, thank you so much. Um, thanks to all of our attendees. I've been in the chat, uh, chatting things up. I know there are people watching from Hamilton, from Guelph, uh, from Toronto, uh, all across the country. And we are so excited for this fireside chat. As was just mentioned, you can put your questions into the chat. I'll also keep an eye on the Q&A uh, feature within Hopin, and um, we will try to get to as many questions as possible. We are gonna wrap up in about 35 minutes. Uh, but first, I have a bunch of questions for Char Sharzad. So, uh, Sharzad, welcome. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you, uh, obviously, uh, to Accelerate Odd for hosting, obviously, this incredible event. And Amber, a big thanks uh, to you for having this conversation with me. I'm very much so excited about the discussion today. Well, thanks for being here. You know, one of the things I love about these virtual events is that uh, people are often in their own homes or offices and they're more comfortable in these conversations. So my first question for you, just to kind of set the tone, where are you right now? I'm actually in my living room. So this is my, this is where I work every day uh, throughout the pandemic. So it's been uh, definitely missing uh, going to the office and very much looking forward to actually, you know, uh, getting back to the new normal in the new year. I think we are all in uh, in that line of thinking as well in terms of getting back to uh, normal. So we have a lot to talk about in terms of how you've grown this incredible business. I have so many questions, but one of the questions I wanted to start with, because so often we get excited when we have entrepreneurs like you and access to asking you what's happening right now, is we forget that so much of what you've done has been built on you know, your childhood, your personal experiences. So the first question I have to you really is about about uh, your childhood and a little bit about your personal journey. Can you walk us through what your childhood was like leading up to starting this business? Of course. Um, I, gr I grew up in Iran, actually. Um, I'm a very proud Persian Canadian, uh, but I did grow up in Iran and uh, during the revolution. And, you know, you can imagine, you know, the opportunities uh, that were limited, you know, uh, specifically given the situation of where I lived, you know, content was very much so rationed. And really inequality was an everyday reality, particularly for me as a young woman. And experiencing that inequality firsthand really creates this desire and passion to be a positive agent for change. And it really brings me back to my favorite quote from Gandhi, which is really to be the change that you wish to see in the world. And you know, that's really why I moved to Canada, to have access to more inclusive and an equal opportunity. And you know, growing up, I always knew, you know, from the time that I was actually, a, a, I was a young teenager that I wanted to build a quadruple bottom line business. And uh, this is what really opened up the possibility of building a quadruple bottom line business. Um, and uh, because really, it really starts with you uh, as we all, of course, play a role. And I believe that really true success is in how we can impact the world to our businesses and uh, that really business and Carl Schwab, uh, Schwab he say, uh, Charles Schwab, he said, he says his best, that business is really the greatest platform for positive change. And this is why I'm so passionate about, you know, our quadruple bottom line, which really means that you know, we measure success, not just based on our financial KPIs, but also based on people, social, environmental uh, KPIs as well. So. Uh, and that's, you know, kind of like a little bit of a backstory on, you know, how uh, I started the business and, you know, why I came to Canada. So let's talk a little bit further about that phrase, quadruple bottom line. I think it's one that some people may know. I'm curious in the chat. Uh, let us know if you've heard of that phrase before. Um, but some people may not. And you touched on it a little bit. Uh, but perhaps you can expand on this because I think it would be uh, an assumption that most, most businesses should follow this. But th they really don't. Uh, so talk to us about how this is built into what you do today. Of course, you know, when we talk about quadruple bottom line, it's just, 
it really means that you want to pay attention to all your bottom lines. And what does that mean? It means that building a quadruple bottom line, it means that it comes down to setting goals, measuring them and reporting on all the bottom lines. So, you know, you need to make sure that you have, you know, the right processes, pipelines, incentives, and really systems in place to make sure that, you know, those goals become a reality. So it really it all comes down to creating both short-term and long-term plans for your KPIs. You know, a lot of times we see companies setting, you know, five-year goals for their people targets. Oh, yes, we want to inc increase female managers, the number of female managers by 25% by in five years' time. It's very important to have both long and short-term goals. And similar to how we actually go and do a, have a financial exercise for our budget, you know, where you budget for your uh, goals, financial goals, it's important to also budget for all the bottom lines, you know, your uh, environmental KPIs, your social KPIs, your people KPIs. You want to really uh, apply that same attention to details that you give to your financial goals to all the bottom lines. And because at the end of the day, they all contribute to a healthier and a more successful organization. You know, and I can give you an example at BBTV. If you look at our people KPIs, and I'm very proud to say that at BBTV, we have a 0% pay gap, uh, you know, for uh, nearly five years. And, you know, over 40% of our employees, managers, and board members identify as female. And this didn't happen overnight. We actually set goals and we try to kind of make sure not only this is a goal that is set by management, but all the managers of the company, they really participate and they're incentivized to achieve that. So we implemented a gender interviewing policy that really ensures that we always interview at least two qualified female and male candidates for every open role. So you really are achieving that, you know, specific, you know, um, diverse work, uh, workforce when it comes to uh, gender and, you know, gender pay and diversity, I think, are very much so tied into uh, the performance targets for our managers. You know, again, as it relates to, you know, kind of how we assess uh, specifically performance, it's not uh, just related to your financial goals, but it also comes down to diversity goals. Uh, when it comes to our environmental KPIs, you know, and uh, looking at it from an environmental perspective, we also are carbon neutral across our global operations, you know, and, and it's important to note that this again requires, you know, you have to do your diligence, you have to partner with the right companies, you need to make sure that you're actually measuring your carbon footprint the right way. And you actually look at, you know, enhancing that, you know, with respect to every, you know, kind of action really counts. You know, I can uh, tell you that pre-COVID, you know, we looked at, for example, our paper usage as a company, you know, how do we track that? How do we actually improve the actual, you know, uh, KPIs and the goals that we set that are, you know, again, realistic, but then also ambitious. So as a company, we're all trying to kind of achieve that, uh, you know, kind of a higher standard of being responsible in terms of how we in impact our environment. Um, so really just like any business pillar, building a quadruple bottom line business really requires the willingness and desire to be accountable to progress. So we trial, uh, we really look at treating all of our quadruple bottom line KPIs with the same level of accountability where, you know, we're looking at our revenue results, gender pay, our carbon footprint, and also our community hours in terms of how we make an impact in both the local and the global community. Uh, but, you know, if you kind of look at it, the world looks a bit different. You know, half of the women, for example, in the world don't make their own income. And closing the gap would really help the world economy by $28 trillion, which is a significant increase. Uh, and if you look at the pandemic uh, with COVID, you know, we've also have taken a few steps back because, as we know, women lost more jobs because of the actual sectors that uh, were more impacted uh, by the pandemic. Um, so building a quadruple bottom line business is really is lead, uh, you know, can, can, can really lead into both a more ethical business, but even a higher performing organization. And I'm sure, you know, you've uh, I'm sure the audience has read many research. I mean, you know, uh, you kind of look at the McKenzie report and many other research that show that, you know, women are well that if, if actually women are well represented at the top of the organization, companies are actually up to 48 percent more likely to outperform in the, you know, when when it comes to uh, the overall peer set. And uh, we've also uh, you know, seen the same thing across our organization when it comes to our team's performance. So 
thinking about your ESG goals is really important in today's business landscape. And it's really becoming increasingly uh, important to, you know, the whole ecosystem, all the constituents uh, and the players from uh, your employees to vendors, uh, to your suppliers, uh, to your consumers. And this is definitely a trend that is going to continue um, uh, as, as we look at, you know, the next five to 10 years, because the consumers are really driving that. They want to be working with companies that are more responsible. Um, and it's also inspiring to actually see how this new generation of entrepreneurs that are also looking at those goals for their businesses right from the outset. So it's you're setting up your organizations the right way from the beginning. So it's not that you're moving on five years in, 10 years in, you're trying to kind of address your inclusivity issues because you have the right foundation in place. Um, and really without a question, good values generate great results. Absolutely. And we're going to talk a little bit more about accountability, but I wanted to ask you next um, to describe for the audience uh, what BBTV does, because I was reading about uh, your story and I've been familiar with your work for a long time now. And it's incredible to see these little pivots that you've made along the way and how the business has evolved. So for people who aren't familiar with what you do, what is BBTV all about? Sure. You know, we're a media tech company and we really exist to advance the world by helping content creators succeed. And when we talk about content creators, we're talking about anyone that creates uh, mainly video content. Um, so we really are, our, our mission is to advance the world by helping content creators succeed, which means that we help them grow their views, make more money. And we house some of the largest content creators in the world that are really defining the culture of today and tomorrow. And, you know, we're really at the uh, center of this massive and fast growing creator economy. If you think about it, you have 52 million content creators in the world that represent more than 100 billion market opportunity. Uh, and this is all driven by, you know, more than 3.6 billion uh, social, you know, users that are consuming that content. And so we're a one-stop shop to help content creators become more successful. So when you talk about content creators, um, you know, many people may think about uh, an individual who is creating videos on YouTube, but you also work with some very large brands and in, in, uh, as well as some entertainment companies too. Yeah, we certainly do. I mean, look, we work with thousands of content owners and creators, and that goes from independent content creators, uh, you know, like Fernand Flew, you know, he's one of my favorite content creators. We started working with him when he was 18 out of El Salvador. Um, and now he's one of the largest uh, international content creators uh, globally. Um, uh, or, you know, you kind of look at uh, content creators like, you know, the NBA or Sony Pictures or Viacom, because at the end of the day, digital really level the playing field. So it doesn't matter if you're a large media company or if you're an independent content creator, you're able to broadcast yourself, you're able to engage with audiences, connect with them and really build a business around, you know, your IP. And this is exactly what we solve for, you know, whether if you're an MBA, Sony Pictures, Fernand Flew, you know, or uh, Chris Booz, you know, we work with you to be, to, be able, to be able to help you succeed, become more successful in extending your IP, getting you in front of the right audiences, grow that audience and really uh, monetize that audience effectively. So let's talk a little bit uh, about something you mentioned a few minutes ago, which is accountability. And um, I think we've seen uh, more importance put on this over the past couple of years. When we talk about leadership and accountability, can you describe how they are part of your everyday running this incredibly successful business? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good question. I, actually, I, I got to say we don't talk about it enough because I think we need to, you know, really take a moment and look at where we find ourselves today. You know, we had the largest global pandemic in over 100 years and, you know, the world is coming out of a lockdown after whole industries have slowed or pivoted or even ceased to exist, right, as we know. And this was closely followed by, I think, one of the most important human rights movements we've, uh, we've seen in the generations, uh, which is Black Lives Matter. So with all that has happened over the last year and a half, you know, uh, there has been really realization as to the importance of leadership. And really at the core of it, you know, we've definitely seen vividly contrasting leadership styles, you know, by business owners, by world leaders um, that have really demonstrated 
dramatically different results, you know, in terms of how we've managed through the pandemic, you know, comforting the public, uh, of course, through loss and upheaval. And, you know, we've become very much so painfully aware of an absence of leadership when it has occurred, you know, and uh, we've seen also strong and unlikely leaders that have also emerged. And, you know, empathy is really at one thing that uh, the best leaders have in common. And I think it's very important for us to really talk about that more because leaders absolutely need to be empathetic in today's very much so diverse world. And I believe that empathy is key to inclusivity. Because we need to be able to listen and to do our best to really understand really the variety of perspectives that uh, we represent and impact to our businesses. And uh, you know, if you look at great leadership, really great leadership is at the heart of positive change in the world. And uh, you know, from accountability, to equality, to justice. I mean, and uh, really the solution, I think, to today's world's problems still lies in great leadership. And I really believe that empathy is at the core of that. It's interesting too, I was reading an article in Forbes and uh, they talked about the pandemic in these terms. They said that uh, the pandemic has been all about sickness, but for leaders, the future will be about a, a sense of wellness, especially for their teams. All of a sudden during COVID-19, you've had to bear this responsibility of making sure that your team is safe. You know, you mentioned that you're in your living room right now doing this event from there. So can you talk about that added responsibility uh, from a leader's point of view and what you've learned as far as lessons along the way? Yeah, it's, it's really important, right? I think that, you know, the pandemic has, uh, you know, I think a lot of times there are discussions, has it, you know, impacted the, the company's culture? Is it better for the company? Is it worse for the company? And we hear it from different industries. The perspective is different. And I would tell you that, you know, look, for us at BBTV, uh, the number one thing is assuring safety of our employees, you know, and it's really easy to say, hey, let's get back to work and let's do in-person meetings. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, we want to make sure that we have a very healthy organization and that more importantly, people feel safe. You know, and it's not just about our employees. It's about their families. It's about their friends. It's about the people that they actually share a living space with, right? Uh, because if you're not healthy and, you know, you know this, you know, we, we spend our, our, our life making money, you know, uh, to, to, and then, you know, the rest of it, you're kind of, uh, you know, spending that money to stay healthy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's really, it comes down to making sure that you are, truly taking care of your employees and they they understand that everything that you do i mean we amplified our wellness program that was a big focus for us from day one you know of the pandemic to make sure that you know we really have not wellness programs that are physical in person it's like you know uh, meditation was a big uh, kind of uh, move for us you know when it comes when it came to our wellness program you know access to you know podcasts vodcasts to you know books you know, uh, even, you know, having specifically uh, getting people digitally in one place so you can actually talk about those common challenges that we're facing. So I think that when we talk about wellness, there's a lot of focus on physical wellness, whereas, you know, we also have increasingly became aware of, you know, the importance of mental uh, health. And, uh, and, and, and how we can actually create a culture where we allow and we give people space to be able to actually speak about those difficult you know, topics, to be able to actually kind of relate to each other and to really celebrate those challenges and be able to make sure that, hey, you know what, we're all in this together, right? So I think, you know, a lot of that comes from having the right wellness programs, making sure that, you know, obviously uh, people are given the right setup at home to make sure that they actually are given you know, uh, the space that they need to be able to actually be physically healthy as well as, you know, at, at have the programs in, pay, in place to really promote uh, mental, mental wellness as well. It's a really good point. I was just writing down, I was thinking about uh, how I'm seeing more and more businesses launching a digital self-care portfolio within the company, which means they may um, subscribe the individuals within the company to uh, meditation apps, or maybe they have uh, wearables like fitness bands that people can get. And that is all part of this focus on wellness. I wanted to switch gears for a second, uh, recognizing that we have so many women who are watching today. And I think it's fair to say uh, for anyone uh, launching a business, uh, there are many challenges for women. Uh, sometimes those are different challenges. So can you talk a little bit about challenges that you faced as a, a woman entrepreneur and, and if and how uh, that affected you in different ways? 
Of course. I mean, you know, when I look back to when I first started BBTV, I really do feel as though I had to really prove myself, you know, especially, and this is 17 years ago, especially when, you know, we were looking for, you know, early investment, you know, our business is very technical. And I think that a lot of the discussions that we've had in earlier days highlighted the need for me to really showcase my expertise. Uh, so would I have faced the same level of scrutiny if I was male, you know, it's tough to say, right. But really the advice that I give all young entrepreneurs, whether male or female, is you know, to really work harder than everyone else and to show that you understand your space and the business opportunity inside out. You know, if you show actually the commitment and the level of intelligence needed to get ahead, people really can't ignore you. And I get I gotta tell you, I mean, you know, I've been in meetings where, like, for example, like the um, you know, with, with other colleagues that were male colleagues where, you know, the investor just wanted, uh, didn't want to necessarily hear it from me, even though I was the CEO. And, and, and that's okay because, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's okay, it's not okay, but I think as an entrepreneur, you've got to really stay focused on your vision. Make sure that you know your stuff inside out because then, you know, you're the person in the room that they're going to have to listen to because you know uh, your business really well. So if I were to actually ask you to, you know, and I think this is an exercise that we do a lot, you know, within a lot of uh, different groups, you know, and I think it's like, if you, if, if I were to ask you to name a few female founding executives, like an Elon Musk or Steve Jobs or Larry Page, you know, there are not many. And so we really need more examples. And I hope that to really inspire the female leaders of tomorrow by demonstrating that it is possible. I want young women to think that she's done it so I can actually do it too. And I encourage everyone in this room to do the same thing. And if you kind of look at our uh, IPO, you mentioned this earlier, you know, BBTV, we had a historic milestone last year during the pandemic going public on TSX. And, you know, if you look at the TSX, our IPO was the largest in history with a sole female founder and CEO across all sectors, while being one of the top 10 tech IPOs all time. So, um, so we really need uh, more milestones like this in Canada and also around the world. Uh, and we really need to break that new ground and pave the way for other women and girls who really envision a future with more potential to be leaders. And we hope that we're contributing to that as a company as well. Absolutely. I just want to say that you're motivating lots of people in the chat. I'm keeping an eye on it. Uh, Mary says, I'm a new immigrant to Canada, currently living in Montreal. Listening to Sharzad's story really inspires me. Uh, Tammy says, Sharzad gets the importance of health. Uh, unhealthy employees equals low productivity. Um, and we also have a comment here from Suzanne saying, our new Canadians have been just killing it on the scale up scene. Um, lots of thumbs up <laughs> in the chat as well. And there are lots of questions coming in. So I'm going to get to the questions in just a couple of minutes. So please, if you do have questions, uh, now is your chance. We have just under 15 minutes left with Sharzad. So we want to get to as many of those as possible. Uh, you touched on uh, your IPO and, uh, you know, some incredible milestones like you mentioned. Uh, what did you learn throughout that process that you can share with many of the founders who are here today? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. And I got to tell you, we keep on learning. Uh, I, uh, you know, even though we had one of the largest IPOs in Canada, uh, we did face uh, quite a few challenges. You know, I think, you know, BBTV, as I mentioned to you, we're a leader in our space in a lot of different ways. You know, we reach 600 million unique viewers monthly. We're the second largest video property after Google, you know, in terms of number of uniques. Uh, and we have, we have, we're the only one-stop shop solution for content creators to succeed in terms of growing their views. Uh, and revenues. And the biggest challenge has been to really help in investors understand our economy and our solutions, given how the Canadian investment community is mainly focused on, you know, resources and defense industries. Uh, so really the biggest learning has been in how to navigate those discussions with investors and how to really distill our very progressive business model into something very much more familiar to their portfolio. So, you know, how can you actually go uh, to them and have that aha moment where they truly understand the value and the scale of BBTV and why it's such a smart investment for them? Uh, and I think the other, you know, I think uh, uh, the biggest lesson that I've learned as an entrepreneur and also as a team at BBTV is that, um, you know, I like to highlight that, you know, really a business's value does not equate to its market cap. 
And, and this is, this is tough. I tell you, because as a private company, you're building a business, you get a valuation, for example, with BBTV, you know, three years ago, we had a billion plus value and you kind of look at our market cap. We're at 10% of that value today. Um, and we're at a 90% discount to our peers in the U S market. But I think it's really important to make sure that, you know, you don't get discouraged that, that your value doesn't really equate to our, your market cap. And when you keep putting out strong results, the market is, is going to catch up. And, uh, and we've seen this challenge firsthand at BBTV. And it's something that, you know, Facebook also experienced, Snapchat experienced, Amazon experienced, a lot of the bigger companies, and we forget about it. So I think as entrepreneurs, you know, if you're looking at, at taking your company public, you know, it's, you know, it may not be the smooth ride, like as much as, you know, kind of, you know, the stories that are told through movies, as far as like the IPO story that you're kind of, we all celebrate. So just remember that your company's value does not equate into your market cap. And it's so important to stay focused on building a strong business and, you know, really putting out good results with strong fundamentals because the market and the investors, they're going to actually catch up. Uh, and again, we've learned a lot, I think, since we went public and we're going to keep on learning. And I think that's really a key trait for being a good entrepreneur. Well, um, again, you're inspiring lots of people. And I feel a little bit greedy asking you this last question because it's all about advice for entrepreneurs in the audience. And you've been so free with so much advice already. But before we get to some of those audience questions, just some final advice uh, for our audience today, you know, the best advice that you feel you can give people who maybe are feeling everything from imposter syndrome, which was just discussed, um, or maybe they're stressed because of the pandemic, maybe they have a family and, you know, there's just a lot going on, whatever that might be. What's your best uh, advice that you can give people right now about continuing on this path to success? Of course, I think first and foremost, you got to take care of your, you know, physical and mental health. I think, you know, it's the most important thing. I mean, you know, if you don't have that, you can't do anything else. So um, if you feel overwhelmed, if you feel like you have too much on the go, take a minute, you know, I, because at the end of the day, you know, we, we did this, you know, uh, over the course of the last month, where Friday afternoons, it was just time off for our employees. And it was just more so about, you got to think about the long game. You know, you can't just think about, okay, what's happening? What's my, you know, if you're looking at your priority list for the day, you really need to think, put your health first, right? So that's uh, number one. And I think that's the biggest lesson that we've learned during the pandemic. Beyond that, you know, as far as being a successful entrepreneur, I always say, look, go after large pools of opportunity. Don't try to solve a small problem if you can actually sol solve a large problem. Why? Because it requires the same amount of work. You know, so you might as well solve a larger problem because it has a larger upside, it has larger impact. Uh, I think it's also very important, Steve Jobs said it best, follow your passion. You know, you know, this is not, you know, if you're in it for the money, it's just not going to, this is, you're going to, you're going to, you're going you're gonna to not succeed. You know, follow your passion because you won't succeed if you don't have passion for what you do. And honestly, life is too short to do anything else. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, I always say BBTV is a, you know, 17 year old overnight success, you know, it's, it's, you know, 20 hours a day, 17 years in and, you know, and I'm as excited about it as I was uh, 17 years ago. So it's really, it comes down to hard work and perseverance. It's, it's really, that's absolute given, you know, you, you know, there's no shortcuts. Uh, and, uh, and of course you need to keep your eye on the long-term vision and, really stay committed to what you're ultimately trying to achieve because, you know, they're like short trends, you know, there are trends that could, you know, kind of, you could get, you know, distracted easily as an entrepreneur. And I think it's very important. The most successful entrepreneurs are the ones that really stay focused on the vision, regardless of all the distractions. And I, I got to finish off with saying this because it's really one of the most important pieces surround yourself with amazing people uh, that will support you and really believe in them, right? You know, delegate, you know, hire smarter people, right? Because they'll make you smarter. They make you look smarter and they challenge you. So, and I think that's something that has really helped us at BBTV in having a really incredible team. And, you know, as we keep on building the team and adding new members, you know, every member adds value and you just really, doesn't matter their seniority, you got to just give them the space to be able to speak up uh, because, um, you know, you got to remember why you hire them. Absolutely. Um, uh, lots of people in the comments. Um, Abigail says, don't try to solve a small problem when you can solve a big one. <laughs> that is excellent advice. 
And I think you're absolutely right that um, growing a business is a grind. So you might as well love what you're doing along the way and find that passion. So we do have a few questions that have come in. We have about eight minutes left. So I'm going to try to get uh, through these questions, but we might have time for a few more. So if you want to drop your questions into chat or into the Q&A, I will do my best to continue to check both. Um, the first question I want to mention uh, is from Lauren. And Lauren asks, what's the first piece of video content? Uh, what should that focus on for a startup? Uh, any hooks or inspiration? And, and how do we get started with that piece of video content? Uh, so Lauren is a content creator. Um, is, is Lauren a content creator? I feel as though um, Lauren is uh, building a company and maybe at a startup because the question is about, I, I think if I understand this correctly, Lauren, and I'll check in chat if you want to elaborate on this, uh, but it's more about um, maybe you're creating a piece of video content to promote your startup um, and she's looking for hooks or inspiration to really get started. Like what, what makes a good piece of video content? Maybe we can make it broader for everybody here. Um, I mean, it all comes down to your purpose, right? This is why I'm just saying, you know, is your purpose to be a content creator? Is your purpose to create video content that actually help you with your uh, specifically promotion, promoting your business? If, if it's around marketing and promotion, you know, the best thing, you know, and we talk about the power of, you know, creator economy and the power of influencers, content creators, right? So it's really good to be able to actually find creators that have that alignment with your brand and your purpose, and then really work on a very much so organic message that would help amplify, you know, your brand, right? You know, it's, it's uh, obviously paid marketing. I think it's, um, you know, it you know, it works to the extent that paid marketing works. But what we're seeing more and more of is really this natural branded integrations, you know, especially when you're trying to kind of establish yourself as a new brand, as an entrepreneur, to be able to do collaborations with specifically content creators that understand your value, understand your purpose, that have that alignment. And you can actually further extend, you know, specifically your uh, message through them. That said, you know, I, I do I believe that obviously paid marketing is, uh, you know, a very established method. You know, at BBTV, we work with brands, we work with advertisers, and, you know, we get them in front of the right audience, you know, uh, and you apply a, a variety of different forms of targeting. And what we are seeing in today's age uh, is that contextual targeting and how, you know, you want to be contextually relevant to audiences and not just uh, looking at the demographic and the behavior of that audience, which is something that is uh, more, a bit more uh, what we've been doing uh, so uh, previously, right? Absolutely. Another question around content, um, and I feel you kind of uh, went into this area a little bit, but this one's from Brian, who's asking uh, about organic versus campaign distribution campaigns. How important is it uh, to campaign across multiple social media platforms or do digital PR, or do you think one can achieve uh, an adequate level of success. Um, so if I want to paraphrase that question a little bit, um, I would say, you know, is it important that that a business, a startup who's trying to uh, build uh, PR in the world is on all social networks? How can that uh, add to their value and their success in the long run? Absolutely. I think that's a must. I mean, in today's age, you do need to meet your customers where they are. And, and, and that means, you know, you have to be across, you know, uh, the social platforms, because, you know, it's at, at the end of the day, if you think about it, you know, these social platforms are really the best medium to be able to listen to your customers, to take their input, uh, to, uh, you know, really pivot and make sure that your solutions are uh, improved. And, you know, I think if you use them as really an, an engagement, you know, mechanism to be able to actually really connect with your audience in a very authentic way, uh, it's the best possible tool that you can actually uh, have at your, in your finger, finger trip, tips. And, and I, I ultimately, I would actually say, look, at the end of the day, you know, you want to make sure that you also have the right social strategy, right? You know, many people, you know, large brands use socials for awareness. Some use it for engagement. You know, I think the ones that are most successful is uh, that, you know, they're there to not only, you know, broadcast their message and to really engage with their audience, to really hear their input, to actually take that input into consideration and to make that as like one of the key, I would say, you know, mediums uh, to be able to connect with their stakeholders. So, yeah, it's definitely a must. Uh, so a, a couple more questions that we're going to try to squeeze in in the next four minutes. Um, and these are less about content, more about going public. The first one is from Senator uh, Colin Deacon, who's asking, what were your biggest challenges as you work to take BBTV public? 
And how do you think that whole process could be improved or streamlined? Um, as far as our IPO, I think, you know, uh, probably as a tech uh, company, I think our biggest challenge was we still, you know, in Canada don't have a large pool of investors that uh, understand tech. So you really need to, and this is kind of, again, the biggest challenge for, uh, with BBTV, if you look at the volume of uh, transactions that we have uh, on our stock, it's very low. Um, and, uh, and, and this was a conversation that I had with a whole bunch of other CEOs uh, and ca Canadian CEOs that where their companies are dually listed, uh, where it's, again, more work in terms of taking the company public, but you definitely have more volume, right? Uh, uh, on your stock and uh, and also industry level expertise within you know our sector you know in terms of uh, the the U S market so um, so I would say that you know uh, processes taking the company public that piece of it is pretty straightforward I mean you know as far as you know you need to plan it you know it takes six to nine months you know having the right team in place making sure that you know again you have the all, all uh, set of right advisors from you know legal counsel. Uh, to your bankers um, and uh, really putting together a very strong syndicate. Um, so it is a lot of work, but I don't think that's a, a bigger challenge here. The bigger challenge for Canada is that we just don't have savvy, you know, we don't have a large pool of investors that understand tech, that embrace tech. We don't have vertical expertise. Uh, and I think uh, it also comes down to retail. I think, you know, we're more conservative as, you know, Canadians altogether. Um, and, um, Whereas with, you know, the retail, I think, investors in the U.S., you know, that profile is just a bit different than what we actually see in Canada. So I think it's just about overall education, understanding that, you know, going public is really a, a great outcome for uh, companies in Canada uh, and, uh, and having a much stronger ecosystem. Uh, I think that's probably the biggest challenge right now. Uh, we just have about a minute left. I would love to squeeze in this question from Jennifer. And I see there are other questions as well. And I apologize we didn't have time to get to them. Um, but this question from Jennifer says, how did you make the decision to go public versus uh, selling or continuing as a private company? Yeah, it was a tough decision. Look, I was offered uh, to sell the business multiple times. And, you know, as an entrepreneur, personally, I could have walked away with more than 100 million cash in my pocket. Uh, but I didn't because, look, you know, in Canada, we need uh, more examples like Google and, you know, Amazon. And, you know, I think many times uh, Canadian entrepreneurs, they sell to, um, you know, just, you know, U.S. companies quickly. And I feel that, you know, um, I'm definitely not one of those entrepreneurs. You know, we have built a very strong business and I think that the next decade is just probably the best de decade ahead for us. Uh, and I, we are in a very strong market uh, and, and, and I think we need more examples. I think, you know, if you look at Shopify, Lightspeed, BBTV, you know, these are all, you know, great examples that show entrepreneurs that there is another option and that the other option is to further, you know, keep on scaling the business and really control your destiny and not to take the shortcut. And again, nothing against, I mean, you know, if you are selling your business, that's again, you know, nothing against that. But I think we just need more role models to show that going public is actually a great outcome. It's a great alternative. Um, and if you're as an entrepreneur in it for a long game, you know, it's definitely the right uh, uh, specifically path for you. Well, listen, um, we want to be respectful of your time. We promised we would wrap around um, 1130 Eastern, and that's exactly what time it is. So I uh, wanted to thank you. wanted to thank all of the attendees today for your excellent questions and your comments. Uh, Sharzad, you've inspired so many people in the chat uh, who are excited to hear from you. And thank you for being that example for so many entrepreneurs out there across the country and around the world. And thanks for being with us today. Of course. Well, I wanted to thank you, Amber. Amazing questions. And thanks to the audience for being so engaging and, you know, you're submitting your questions. And again, thanks to Accelerate Odd for hosting this incredible event. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. So many amazing insights about the journey to IPO. Thank you, Sharzad and Amber for sharing uh, that story, for sharing parts of your journey, Sharzad. I like to share a little bit of facts that I get from when I watch, um, but uh, some really interesting comments. Having women in your company across all levels of leadership and on your boards will help you create a more innovative Thinking about inclusion from the beginning, building it right into the fabric of your organization. Good values generate great results. 
And there's some recurring things that I'm starting to see across, you know, the conversations we're having. Stay focused, prioritize your health, do something you're passionate about, and surround yourself with a strong network of people. So just a couple of things that I took, some gems I want to share with you all. I'm going to give people who are watching virtually an opportunity to make your way over to stage two. The next conversation we're going to be having is the tech founders panel. So I'm going to give them a little bit of a minute to get there.